right, engineers, so in this video, we're going to talk about the actual structures of the respiratory system um, on this half head model. All right, so let's start ahead here, kind of right around this area here. So if we look here, I want to make sure that we're very clear here. This inner area here of the nasal cavity, the inner area here, right around this part, that is actually called the vestibule. There's actually kind of like a little vestibule here. Then, actually, if I were to come through this area here, the air coming in through this area, through this outer hole here, is called the external nares. It'll move through that hole. There'll be like a little vestibule-like area there. And then there's going to be a lot of, you know, basically your, your inner cavity here, this inner nasal cavity, is going to be rich in a specific type of tissue, the epithelial tissue. It's called pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue, which is very important because the cilia are helping to basically perform functions like beating of the mucus. It's also going to help to warm the air, moisten the air, filter the air, uh, humidify the incoming air. Also, in certain people, you might notice these basically these nose hairs. And the, you know, they have what's called these things called vibrisae, the nose hairs. Those are important too because they help to be able to pick up certain particles that are coming through the actual uh, nose area, right? So they're gonna be having these things called vibrisae. All right, so then if you come into the nasal cavity here, so you come through the external nares and you move into the nasal cavity, there's going to be this structure here which is actually called the superior nasal concha. Then up here is going to be the middle nasal concha. And this is going to be the inferior nasal concha. And in between the superior nasal concha and the middle nasal concha is the superior meatus. In between the middle nasal concha and the inferior nasal concha is the middle meatus. And in between the inferior nasal concha and the hard palate, right, the roof of the hard palate, is going to be this inferior meatus. Why is these structures important? Because as air is flowing through the nasal cavity, these concha and the meatus work together to basically turbulent, uh, turbul turbulate the air coming in. And what that helps to do is that if you have that turbulation of the air, it increases the contact of the air with the mucosal surface to help to humidify the incoming air, warm the air, moisten the air, and even help to perform a little bit of filtering with the air. Okay, as the air gets passed from the external nares into the nasal cavity, through these actual meatus and concha, they come back here to this little posterior part of the nasal apertures. You see that kind of that orange line there? It's basically separating this certain part here. Because once you come through, you come through the external nares to get into the nasal cavity. As you get to the posterior nasal apertures, you have this basically kind of like a dividing line here. That's called the internal nares. So this orange line is just kind of giving you an idea that this is the internal nares. All right, just some surrounding structure so that we kind of uh, know our orientation here. There's a little hole here. It's kind of, if I were to poke up through that hole, that's actually called the pharyngotympanic tube or the auditory tube or the eustachian tube, you can, whatever you want to call it. It's the tube that basically is connected to the middle ear. It helps to drain the middle ear to basically equalize the pressures with the atmosphere in the middle ear. Around it is actually going to be a specific type of lymphatic tissue called a tonsil, which is actually referred to as the tubal tonsils. This is actually called the tubal tonsils. And then posterior, in the posterior aspect of the nasal cavity, is actually going to be this other lymphatic tissue called the pharyngeal tonsils. All right? Then, if we keep going, we also have this structure right up here, if you can see it. This is actually a part of the frontal bone. It's right behind the the actual outer aspect of the frontal bone is called the frontal sinus. It's one of the paranasal sinuses, right? And then if you look here, this would actually be a part of the ethmoid bone. And then this is going to be the sphenoid sinus right here. This is the sphenoid sinus right there. And you can tell that because the pituitary gland is sitting right in the cell tercic here. So this is the sphenoid sinus. Then if we follow this here, this part of the actual nasal cavity, the floor of the nasal cavity, uh, which is going to be the roof of the oral cavity, if you think about it, this is the hard palate. So this is the hard palate. Then you're going to have this back part here, which is like H and little h. This is the soft palate. And the soft palate give off a little extension here, which is I. You can kind of see it right there. That's actually called the uvula. Okay. Now, the hard palate is important because obviously it's made up of like a lot of bone, maxillary bone. And then the soft palate has a little bit of bone, but it has a lot of muscle and a lot of other connective tissue structures around it. These are important, the soft palate's important because there's a lot of muscles like, you know, the te uh, tensor veli palatini and the palatic loss, there's a lot of different muscles here. And what happens is, whenever we're basically swallowing, let's say that for some reason we're eating food, whenever we swallow, 
the actual uvula will, there the soft palate will elevate, so the palate will elevate, and the uvula will actually come upwards and block off the nasal cavity so that the food will not go up into the nasal cavity, it only will go downwards into the esophagus, which is pretty cool. Now, another thing here is if you look here, you're gonna kinda see like this arch, this arch here, if I come down like this, there's like this arch here. This is actually called the palato pharyngeal arch, okay? This is called the palato pharyngeal arch. Then if you look over here, there's another one which is coming in the oral cavity. This is called the palato glossal arch. If you kind of follow it like this, this is the palato glossal arch. This is the palato pharyngeal arch. And in between these, we actually call it the fauzes. In between this is the palatine tonsils, okay? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some of the actual structures in the actual, what's called the pharynx, or the different layers of the different sections of the pharynx, if you will. So if we look here, we're actually going to notice uh, three distinct layers. We have them identified by colors. So you can see green, you can see red, and you can see blue. So the pharynx is actually divided into three sections. Up here in the nasal cavity portion, this green portion here, this is actually called the nasopharynx. So the nasopharynx is important because it's actually made up of pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue. Now you might be like, okay, that's cool. Well, it's important because this is, should only be coming into contact with air. So the nasopharynx should only be coming into contact with air. Why? Because remember, the actual uvula will come up and block the actual nasopharynx and prevent food or fluids from moving up into the nose. Then you're gonna have this red section of the pharynx, which is called the oropharynx. The oropharynx is actually going to be made up of a stratified squamous epithelial tissue. And you might be like, okay, again, cool. Well, that's important also because it should be only coming, it should be coming into contact with food, fluids, and air, right? So it can be coming into contact with food, fluids, and air. So you want it to be able to resist against abrasion and friction. Then this blue segment here is called the laryngopharynx. And the laryngopharynx is actually made up of stratified squamous epithelial tissue because again, it has to come into contact with food, fluids, and air. All right, another thing. So again, we mentioned the palatopharyngeal arch, we mentioned the palatoglossal arch, which we call the fauzes, right? We have the fauzes, and in between the fauzes, we have the palatine tonsils. Another thing is we have this little tonsil in the back of the tongue here called the lingual tonsils, okay? Just trying to give you guys orientation of these different structures around. All right, next. <coughs> After we come from the pharynx, this last part here called the, the laryngopharynx, we're gonna try to have the air go here and into the actual larynx. And what happens is, whenever you're not swallowing, this sphincter here, this is the esophagus, this little tube here in the back, this tiny little tube that you see right here, this tiny little tube here is actually called the esophagus. And what happens is, the upper esophageal sphincter will actually keep it constricted until we actually swallow food. Then there'll be reflexes with the vagus nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve and other different types of nerves like the accessory nerve that'll play a role within uh, pharyngeal contraction, esophageal contraction, laryngeal contraction, right? But again, this is usually closed so that air will only go into the larynx. Now, if you see right here, uh, they're denoting it with like the Roman numeral one here, or I. This is actually going to be the epiglottis. The epiglottis is important because it's actually made up of a very special type of uh, connective tissue. It's actually made up of what's called elastic cartilage. And elastic cartilage is important because it basically helps with being able to have flexibility and recoiling like ability. So it can actually be uh, stretched and recoil back to it and assume it's normal size, all right? So that's the epiglottis. What's its special function? Well, you know, whenever food is coming down, not only does the uvula elevate, but the food will actually push on the epiglottis. And as it pushes, it kind of bows over and blocks the larynx from any, any food coming in and directs the food only specifically down into the esophagus, okay? So that's the epiglottis. And there's a little ligament there which is actually connecting the epiglottis to the hyoid, so it's called the hyoepiglottic ligament, right? Then if we come down, we can actually kind of see here if I, uh, we'll, co we'll cover these cartilage here in just a second. Let's cover the actual mucosa first of the uh, larynx. So as you come in, if the air is coming in, there's an inlet then. So Y is representing what's called the laryngeal inlet. So as the air is coming right into the larynx, right under the epiglottis, it's called the laryngeal inlet. Then if you look here, 
there's actually going to be two parts of the actual, there's two vocal folds, if you will. This top one up here, the top part, so if you can kind of see here, there's actually kind of like a central sinus here, a little cavity there. That little cavity is not the vocal cords. It's a little cavity there, like, kind of like a little central sinus. Above that cavity is a little fold, and that's actually called the false vocal cords, okay? Above this little cavity. Below the cavity is another fold, all right, which is made up of kind of like these little tight collagen cords. And this is actually going to be the true vocal cords, all right? Why is this important? Because whenever you basically are pushing air out to speak, the air is moving across these actual true vocal cords. And these vocal cords are vibrating, and depending upon the amount of tension it has on it, determines the frequency of the vibrations. And those vibrations will actually move up and have, you know, resonate within different chambers of the oral cavity, the nasal cavity. And a lot of these muscles in this of speech and a lot of different muscles in the pharynx and larynx play a role within basically helping to form those vibrations into actual words. So it's unbelievable, uh, which is called the process of phonation. All right, so, and we'll look at another model, you'll be able to see the glottis. But I don't want you guys to just get that confused because again, that little central space there is not the glottis. The glottis is the space between the true vocal cords. And we'll see that in another model when we're looking down the larynx. We'll actually look down the larynx, okay? So again, that's the true vocal cords. That's the false vocal cords. And then, if we keep coming down a little bit, so if we go past the true vocal cords and we're gonna go past what's called the cricoid cartilage, we're gonna go into this area here. And if you see here 23, it's actually trying to represent that we are now in the trachea. So once we pass what's called the cricoid cartilage, we enter into what's called the trachea. And we'll see this a lot better in another model. But again, I want you to realize, we're gonna take a look at a lot of these cartilage here in a second. But again, this is the cricoid cartilage right here. This is actually kind of like the only cartilage on the, uh, around the larynx that goes all the way around. Okay, so this is the cricoid cartilage right there. Um, and then you're gonna have another one which is actually going to be, you're going to be able to see a little bit of it right there too. So that's another part of the cricoid cartilage. And this is actually going to be called the arytenoid cartilage right there. Uh, but you can't really see the arytenoid cartilage. It actually is covered by a, what's called the arytenoid uh, muscles. And uh, it's important because they play a role within controlling the actual tension on those vocal cords. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to turn it anteriorly so we can see a little bit more of these actual cartilage structures. And again, we'll have a lot, we have another model that we'll be able to see this, all these structures a lot better on. Okay, but just to cover it for the sense of having this model accessible. Okay, so this is the hyoid bone right here. And then again, right underneath this, there's a little ligament, which is connecting the hyoid bone to this actual thyroid cartilage. So this is the thyroid cartilage right here. And this little ligament here is called the thyrohyoid uh, ligament, because it's connecting the thyroid cartilage to the hyoid bone. And then if you know, the thyroid cartilage, when it actually comes together, it forms like a very, very prominent part right here, which you can see in most people, which is called the laryngeal prominence, or you know, as most people refer to it as the Adam's apple. However, in males, it's a little bit more prominent because testosterone is actually increasing the production of this hyaline cartilage within the males during the actual uh, puberty and growth period, right? So it should be a little bit more prominent within males, well, hopefully, all right? And then, Again, this is the thyroid cartilage. If you go down here, there's actually going to be another cartilage right here. This is actually called the cricoid cartilage. We saw that before. And you can kind of see a little piece of it anteriorly here. In between the cricoid cartilage here and the thyroid cartilage, there's actually going to be a little ligament there. And that ligament is called the cricothyroid ligament or thyrocricoid ligament. That's all. It's just the ligament connecting these two cartilage. All right, so that's that. Now, if we come back over here again, if I turn this guy a little bit over here again, you're actually going to see this is the other part of the cricoid cartilage. And again, it's one of the, car the cartilage that comes all the way around. Okay, it comes all the way around. All right, so that's the cricoid cartilage. And again, above that would be the arytenoid cartilage. So we'll talk about the arytenoid and the corniculate and the cuneiform and the other model because we can see those a lot better. But again, just realize that this would right here is the arytenoid cartilage. But as you can see, you can't see the actual hyaline cartilage. It's just like a little bit of uh, soft tissue and muscle there, which again are important for basically controlling the tension on those vocal cords. All right, engineers, so in this video, we covered a decent amount of information here on the half head for the respiratory system. I hope all of it made sense. I hope you guys did enjoy it. If you guys did, please hit the like button, comment down in the comment section, and as always, please subscribe. All right, engineers, until next time.